Hello. Now we are in the last session of our first part, and this pertains to miasms. As uh, you all know, there are many definitions of miasms, and the science of miasms can very easily be described as miasmology. So, we would like to cover the session on miasmology in introduction. Now friends, you know, there are many definitions of miasm. And miasm word has been in vogue before Henneman also, but with Henneman it has got a special connotation because he introduced this word specially for chronic diseases and wherein the chronic diseases particularly that of Sora Henneman emphasized the word of miasm and it became synonymous with Sora the each theory which it was called at the time of uh, Henneman and it was Henneman was coughed for this particular concept of miasm. The contemporaries at the time of Henneman did not accept it, did not accept his theory of miasm. Uh, especially after the death of Henneman, some time afterwards, gradually this uh, uh, profession of homeopathy took special interest in miasms and the theory got revived. The concept of miasm has somehow or the other become highly theoretical and much of theoretical discussions take place on miasms and so much of uh, generalizations and so much of impractical, theoretical, complex things which we have been hearing during our student life make us either interested or disinterested in this theory of miasm. Basically, if we look to the concept of miasm, we have to make one thing very clear in our mind, that Henneman started his theory of similia, but in so far as the cause is concerned, Henneman took a special interest in the causation. In aphorism 5, from 4th edition onwards, he put the word of miasm that is exciting cause and fundamental causes and from then onwards this theory of miasm became more and more heightened after he published his chronic diseases. Now we need to explore the basic concepts of miasmology because it relates to day to day practice of homeopathy and not such theoretical ideations which pertain to writing long essays on who was the first patient and how it was corrected and wherein the miasm came for the first time. All these theoretical connotations may sound very high, but in so far as the real results are concerned, these things are not at all very much useful for us. Let us focus at our agenda now. We have listed six points here as you can all see. Classification of miasms. Then number two, Henneman a genius. Then miasmology a sine qua non for cure essential aspect. Sources of miasmological evidence wherein we get miasmological evidence from. Then hidden causes and finally, we have focused on secondary Sura mind. <coughs> Sorry. Now, before we go ahead, we have to remember one thing that somehow or the other, this seven eighths of the chronic diseases being caused by Sora, the dictum which was given by Henneman, has been washed away. And now, what we hear and what we read and what we 
uh, find our teachers telling us including my own teachers also and that is that hardly there are soric cases now and most of the cases are syphilitic and psychotic now that concept is not in tune with hanuman we have to consider that aspect also so now we go ahead to classification of miasms now miasms does not mean chronic miasms alone in organon hanuman described acute miasms and that is for specific diseases like cholera typhoid pneumonia diphtheria etc then fixed miasms for example whooping cough smallpox etc here the word fix is there because uh, the nature of these diseases is less variable and the picture is more or less similar and there is individual variation to a very less extent that is why it is fixed then half spiritual miasm now half spiritual miasm word is implied because first of all what happens there is fever and after fever after some time some eruptions come so eruptive fevers are described as half spiritual miasms and in our country also these diseases are called scarlet fever of course is not here in our country but measles and pox are called mata like mother sickness as if there is some spiritual thing behind because after the eruptions appear suddenly the symptoms become less so this word has been connoted by him half acute miasm now here one particular disease hydrophobia or rabies is such that we find that the incubation period is very very long it runs for months together and unlike acute diseases the uh, after a long long incubation period it then takes a course of an acute disease that is suddenly the symptoms develop and a rapid course of the disease is there like an acute disease so it has got both the features of a chronic disease as well as an acute disease that is why this particular miasm has been named as half acute miasm then the chronic miasms that is quite well known these three miasms sora psychosis and syphilis you will see why we have written psychosis before syphilis that is because it is very simple alphabetically c comes before p that is why we have listed these soric psychotic and syphilitic these three chronic miasms so in this way the classification of miasm tells us about acute half acute and the chronic miasms then we go to hanuman a genius now one thing is very clear that whenever we talk of hanuman profession outside the profession there is always a hue and cry that why homeopaths focus only on one person hanuman hanuman and hanuman and is there not any other person who has done greater work or at least equal work to what hanuman has done a man did some work so many years before two centuries before and still homeopathy is identified with the name of this person now the reason is there is another side of it also so is it that because over 300 years have lapsed then hanuman should become outdated does it mean that lapse of years makes a work outdated no that is not so in fact he was a genius he was an exception the likes of which are born once in millenniums and it is rightly said by iqbal hazaron sar nargis apni benuri pe roti hai badi mushkil se hota hai chaman mein deeda aur paida now this is a contribute to the tremendous contribution that hanuman has made to homeopathy he has not only done the research work prior to discovery of homeopathy he has contributed to the discovery of homeopathy and after that he has seen 
that homeopathy has developed under his care. He has seen the practice of homeopathy and analyzed the difficulties that have come in the way of practice of homeopathy. And after that, he has given a shape to homeopathy and was active till the last breath. That is till his 88th year. He was in full-fledged practice in Paris and his practice is uh, uh, something which is a matter of record and in uh, uh, Rima Handley's book In Search of Later Henneman we can read about the nature of practice which Henneman had till his very last age. Let us remember what he very boldly said that conduct the experiments on yourself and publish the failures to the world. That is, whatever I am telling you, Animan says, is all practical. It is not a mere theory. It is what which is verifiable on the patients. So you conduct the experiments yourself on the patients and publish the failures to the world if any. So much confidence he had and even today, what Henneman's teaching is there, it is correct only because it is practically implementable. Then, the next question comes that is miasmology an essential aspect? Is it a sign qua non for cure? Is it that if we do not believe in miasms, we cannot cure the chronic patients? In fact, that is so, because chronic diseases are not cured merely on the basis of totality of symptoms which are visible on the surface. Patient comes to us with certain symptoms, certain complaints, be it diagnosed, be it undiagnosed. Now this way if we approach, that is if we focus on the present symptoms, that then homeopathy gives some results of palliation and partial relief at the best. But the cure does not take place because the chronic miasms which are hidden behind, they need to be duly considered. And the remedy which we select must not only cover the miasm, miasmatic aspect, but must cover totality of symptoms also. So this is an all-inclusive approach. This is not an exclusive approach that miasm and miasm alone, it, that will be called exclusive. So it is not so. It is inclusive. That means that the totality of symptoms must be covered and it must include coverage to the miasmatic aspect also. Now, primarily, there are only three chronic miasms as we have seen, we have written there, sora syphilis psychosis, and all other names which have been added subsequently are combinations. Like, you know, tubercular miasm. That is, you add sora and syphilis and call it congenitally mixed and tubercular. So instead of calling it tubercular, you can call it sora and syphilis. Also, syphisora also. Then cancer, AIDS, etc. have been described as miasms by many homeopathic authorities of past and present. But friends, we can do very well without naming them like that. Like we have three primary colors, but out of these primary colors, numerous shades evolve from them. So it is always good to remember these miasms primarily as the basic miasms and not name them. Because you know, I have been reading and hearing the other day that somebody was telling as many patients, so many miasms. Now that shows ignorance because there are persons who talk like this that any medicine and every medicine can be curative. Now if somebody says that any and every medicine can be curative, that tells the ignorance about the effect of the or the role of the medicine because the correct medicine has to be the correct one. Any and every medicine is curative, so any and every disease or any and every patient is a miasm in itself, is like that. It is an ignorance. It shows that there is no necessity to believe in miasm. That is what the person who tells things like that. 
and that is going to put us into ignorance. So let us just ignore such advices. Then we go to the sources, how to collect the information or the evidence about miasm. The sources of miasmological evidence uh, is a thing on which a lot of work has been done right from the time of Hanuman. A lot of evidence has gathered about the miasms. Information is there about the miasms. And later towards further added data to it. We should regard the practical experiences only in consonance, that is in tune, in tune with what Henneman has said. And for that purpose, only theory and only imaginary data, if there be any, it should be of little use. Because the logics which are very high sounding, big bombastic words and explanations and basic theories and basic uh, imaginary concepts and philosophy can only be entertaining. They can be muse, but these are not on easily comprehensible principles because Henneman has said that the cure has got to be on easily comprehensible principles and that is why the things have got to be understandable. That is the sources of miasmological evidence should be understandable. Let us see. So, the sources of miasmological evidence, as we see, are basically from the family history and including the obstetrical history of the mother. And that is, these diseases have got to be noted specially, exclusively. That is family history. Then past history, including very early history, very early history, the very early history in one-sided diseases. That is right from birth, what was the first disease which the patient has suffered from? That can throw light on the miasma logical aspect. Then personal history, then under this personal history, the hidden causes which Henneman has mentioned in Footnote to aphorism 93, which we shall see. So that also throws light on the miasmatic aspects. Then pathophysiological state. That is the disease pathology. The disease pathology is not the sole evidence, but also a contributory evidence to the miasmological diagnosis. Even generalities, because the symptomatologically uh, there are presentations of different miasms. So, generalities are also throwing important evidence on that and also mental state. The mental state of the patient also gives a contributory evidence to the diagnosis. That is the evidence which it throws for, which shall be useful for the conclusion of miasmological diagnosis. Then the hidden causes. Now, Henneman has said these hidden causes like attempted suicide, masturbation, indulgence in immoral activity, debauchery, which could be natural debauchery or unnatural debauchery, infection with venereal disease and infection with itch. Then, then after this, we see unfortunate love, jealousy, domestic infelicity, that is injustice, cruelty, inappropriate behavior which the patient uh, re receives domestically. That also is a very important factor. Worry, grief on account of some family misfortune, some ill usage, then barked revenge, that is a revenge which is obstructed, which is held up, which is not expressed outside. So this type of uh, barked revenge, then 
injured pride now this particular matter is to be carefully and scrutinously found out from the patient and it is not so easy patients don't come with a bag of mental symptoms which they keep on our table and this is a matter of an art if we are aware then we are able to take it out because it is said that eyes cannot see what the mind does not know so first the mind has got to know it if the mind knows it then it can make the eyes to see that and that is called perception so these causes we must try to explore embarrassment of a pecuniary that is financial nature now financial embarrassments in past or in present they contribute a greatly important feature and then superstitious fear this superstitious fear which uh, the conclusion of superstition is to be drawn as per the cultural family and education background of the individual because what is superstition to a particular community may not be so to other one so physician has got to be very alert with respect to the cultural background the family background and also the educational background and accordingly he must draw a conclusion to this particular fact so this all has been described in footnote 2 aphorism 93 which each of us should very carefully read it and try to implement it to the current scenario that is in the light of the current knowledge of psychiatry because it is psychiatry which pays attention to these factors and homeopath has to be a good student of psychiatry because it throws a special light on what hanneman has described and it helps in understanding hanneman better then finally that takes us to secondary sora mind now here i must tell you that in chronic diseases hanneman has described the latent sora in theoretical part and secondary sora when you read the 60 symptoms of latent sora hanneman has not mentioned any symptom of mind that is latent sora mind whereas we have been taught that latent sora is alert latent sora is uh, intelligent latent sora is uh, um, uh, very keen and the characteristics of the latent sora mind have been described by authors in their books which includes robert as well as allen but ultimately the teaching of hanneman has got to be seen what hanneman said secondary sora mind he describes and he describes disturbances of mind and spirit of all kinds that is everything under the earth the disturbances of mind primarily are sorry melancholy we have only mentioned points which is like depression then anxiety features of anxiety anxious depression in the morning anxious depression in the evening then features of anxiety with restlessness then melancholy palpitation and anxiousness mania of self destruction which includes the fits of suicidal mania then <coughs> a weeping mood <coughs> then sorry after weeping mood we see attacks of fear attacks of passion then fright which is sudden fear by trifles causes perspiration and trembling disinclination to work lethargy in otherwise industrious people and excessive sensitiveness and irritability from weakness and quick changes of mood now these features most of them pertain to anxiety and depression if we look to the basic characteristics of anxiety and depression from the modern books on psychiatry we find that the hanneman's secondary sora mind very largely covers the two conditions 
one is anxiety and second is depression one of the leading psychiatrists of calcutta when a student of homeopathy a sincere student of homeopathy when he referred this picture of a chronic disease to him uh, he was astonished that how is it that about 175 years back a person could describe so typically the anxiety and depression the characteristic features of these two diseases no wonder that anxiety and depression today also cover the largest portion of psychiatric conditions and that is what hanneman said that 7/8 of the chronic diseases are caused by sora so this particular thing has to be remembered by us so that completes our today's talk and our part 1 session thank you we shall see in the next meeting thank you